All right, man. What's going on? Y'all know what time it is, man. It's Monday night, and we back with another episode of Reentry Journey Podcast. You know, I'm your host, Cordell Sims. Today, I got a guest. My guest, he's gonna tell you a story. He's gonna tell you about his transition and everything. Our guest tonight is Mr. David Hopper. I appreciate you coming on, uh, reaching out to me. I'm reaching back out to you, um, joining our group tonight, joining my podcast to let people hear the story in your transition. Uh, if you don't know, the group and our podcast is about people that been to prison that got out, that made a successful transition. May not have been easy, but they did it. They stuck to it. You know, I, I found your story. You reached out to me. I, I, I seen your story, and you fit the criteria, man. I, I'm glad to have you on. Thank you. you. Know, uh, just go ahead and let the people know, introduce yourself, and tell the people your story. All right. My name is David Hopper. Um, formerly incarcerated individual. Uh, my incarceration was seven years. Sentenced to seven years. I did six flat out of that. Um, born and raised in Harlem, New York. The Washington Heights part of Harlem, actually, uptown. Um, single parent. Raised... Um, single parent home house household raised by my mother my aunt my grandmother um and uh homeless as a child my mom's my siblings was homeless uh for about three and a half years the time we had from age 13 to 16 almost 17 we was in and out of the shelter systems um in new york we have uh Back then, we had welfare hotels, what we call welfare hotels. So for about three years, three and a half years, we was in and out of the system. Um, so I got about 17, 17, did one year in high school, and then I went to job corps. And from there, I pretty much turned into an adult. And from that, uh, 17, I met a guy, which is now actually my best friend for over 20 some years. He was in job corps with me. Uh, we, you know, we needed a way to make some money after we came home from job call. And one of his family members actually was already in the streets selling drugs, crack. And uh, as a 16, 17 year old kid, I seen the way out and I took it. And from that, that actually led me to all types of uh, criminal activities from robberies, shootings, like I said, drug selling, uh, you know, all kind of mischief. And from that point, you know, you do something long enough, you graduate, right? right. So <laughs> I, I graduated uh, from petty crimes and things of that nature to um, fel felonious activities. And dealing with the felonious activities, I got caught up and uh, I got arrested. I did, uh, I got my first felony, actually when I was about, 28, I believe. So I was I had a good bid. I had a good I had a good run. I had my little, you know, brushes with the law, but nothing serious. Uh, I was always blessed, if you will, to skate or get around some technical difficulties and things of that nature. And then uh my first felony was a drug charge. I had 44 what they call dimes in New York. We selling ten dollar pieces of a crack. Uh, and I got caught with 44. That was a whole fiasco. I, I needed to get caught. I did something stupid. And, um, yeah. Right. And, um, that led me to my first felony. And then four years later, actually, yeah, four years later, I was still in the streets. I had, this time I had one foot in, one foot out. I had a good job, but I was still, my mentality was still kind of, uh, not even kind of. My mentality was still immature. My my mentality and my age didn't match. So at that point, I got an argument. So I always had an anger issue. So I, I got an argument, which is what the bus, which is what the um, the book talks about. I got to an argument, and that argument actually led into me shooting somebody. And at that point, the uh, police tracked me down. I got arrested and that's where I did my bid at. That's where, you know, the seven years came in that. <clears throat> and uh that's that's pretty much the beginning of it all. All right. So you um 
So you 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 locked up. You in the prison. You got seven years. Excuse me. What was that? What was that? What was going through your mind that you felt like you needed to do while you was incarcerated? Um, really, <laughs> truthfully, I didn't really feel like I, I needed to get home. Right. right. That was really I just need to get home. Let me get home and then I figure everything else out. And unfortunately, that's the mindset that a lot of a lot of us have when we get locked up. Unless you, you know, unless you actually mentally uh or mature enough mentally and you just out there doing crimes and you know the repercussions, when you get locked up, when at least when I when I got locked up, I didn't really understand the repercussions. I just knew like, okay, I get locked up, I do a little time, I come home. And I told you before, prior, I was getting slaps in the wrist. So I wasn't thinking no years, no stretch. I was just thinking, you know, I do my little, my little time and come home. But when I got locked up, when that sentence, when that gavel dropped and I got that seven year sentence, I was thinking about how I need to get home. Right. That was my 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 main objective. My main thought was, I gotta get the hell out of here. I gotta make All it right. back home. All right. So you so you did your time. You 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 did your time. So you get released. What were some of the things that you faced once you got released? Oh, the release was re re release was. I would like to tell you it was like a culture shock. It was like uh, jumping in, or not even jumping in, because jumping in, you're prepared, right? If you jump into a, a pool, you're prepared for what's going to happen versus somebody throw you into the pool and you like, oh, you know. So right. that's pretty much was the what I was feeling when I got released into, this, into the world. It was a shock. Um, six years, because out of the seven years, I did six years. Exactly six years. I went in on Summer Jam Sunday, which is like June third, and I came home. I was my release date was June third, six years later, but it fell on a Sunday, so I came home that Friday, June first, and uh, it was um a beautiful thing and a nightmare at the same time. It was a dream and a nightmare, all in the same in the same moment. So I came home six years later. Luckily, when I went home, I understood. I seen cell phones. I seen the metro card system. They were just turning over from tokens to metro card. So I had an idea of, of that. But um, just the way things was moving. When I went in, we was baggy, baggy clothes, baggy jeans, you know, straight fit. When I came home, everything was skinny. It was metrosexual, right? right. Um, <laughs> all of this stuff. So I was on the train. I was telling my brother, I'm like, "Yo, he got on shorts. That's why he got skinny shorts on." I don't, I couldn't understand why his shorts were so tight. Right. And then my brother, was like, "Nah, he not." I'm like, "And not anything towards the LGBTQ community," but I'm like, "I he he gay? Like he doesn't look gay, but the clothes and the look." doesn't I'm I was wow. thrown off, you know. So that was just one thing. Just um everything now was a, a lounge. There was no clubs. It was only like two clubs, which was one stage 48 we had in New York. And then um I think it was like one other club. I know stage 48 was the, like the main club. But when I before I got locked up, that's all it was was clubs. Now it was lounges, it was day parties. So that was another thing. So I came home on that Friday. Uh, I think that next weekend somebody would say, oh, yo, I'm going to take you to a day party. What do you mean a day party? Like, like what's a day party? Like, oh, that's the new thing, the brunches. I'm like, I don't want to go to no day party. Like, who goes to a day party? Right? Yeah, I'm just going to ask you, what's a day party? <laughs> so a day party is actually a party that usually starts at 4 o'clock. And last for about ten, and then they have they close the spot down, and then about eleven, they're letting in for the regular night party. But 
it's it coincides with a brunch. So brunches usually start 10, 11 ish in that in the morning. So they have uh all you can eat. So it's like a package. So you pay fifty dollars for a meal and all you could drink. So it'd be mimosas, uh rum punches, any kind of whatever special drinks they have. Okay. And you party. It's a DJ and it's an actual party in the daytime. Right. So that was the wave in New York when I came home. Yeah, that was that I had no part of the, the culture shop. Right. I had no I'm like, what is this? You know. So it was things like that and just um getting reacquainted with my kids, you know, because my kids now I went in, they was six, I think eight, 14, 15, and 16. I come home to grown people. Right? right. So my son is my son was 12, 14, maybe. My daughters was 20, 21, 22, something like that. They grown, they adults. You know, when I got locked up, they was kids. First years of high school. So it was a lot of uh, getting reacquainted and just trying to figure out what the hell is going on out here. Right. And actually, and on top of the personal side, then you have to, then I had to deal with parole, the DOC. Um, that was a whole nuance. I had to do anger management. I had to do um had to report the parole. We got pay parole, right? How you pay parole? You don't have no money. I don't have no job. You want me to pay you to be to come visit you? Then if I don't come visit you, you lock me up. Yeah, yeah, that's how it go. Yeah, they that's how they do it. I'm from Missouri, and that's how that's how it is in Missouri. When I got out of state prison, they was like. And they weren't doing it, but it seemed like probably a year before I got out, they implemented this. You got to pay every month. I'm like, right. I, I paid. I paid with my time. You know what I'm saying? Right. I paid my. What you mean? I got to pay? You know, mm -hmm. I got to pay to come and see you. Yeah, that's how they right. did. Yeah, I was like, oh man, I thought I thought I paid with my time. Right. So you know that was that was something to deal with. So it was it was it was obstacles. It was more obstacles than it was assistance you know they tell you because when we leave state prison in new york they give you these phases phase one phase two phase three phase four so these are like classes inside that's supposed to get you ready equip you for the free world they really don't right here sitting with you this moment and I was trying to think of it before we got on so I could break it down. I can't remember what phase one, two, or three was. <laughs> I can't right. I can't remember right. because it was it was bogus. It it really wasn't nothing to really help me because at that time I wanted the help. I needed the help. So anything that somebody gives me to help me, assist me, I'm gonna remember it in some form or fashion. I can't remember nothing. Only thing I remember is phase four. And phase four was um, the little bits and pieces that I remember. It was more or less like coping mechanisms and scenarios. Like, okay, if your friend, you, you just came home, you've been home for a little while, you have a car, your friend asks you to use your car. You let him use the car, he comes back, he gives you the keys, nothing, you know. The next morning, police knocking your door, say there was a shooting in your car. What do you do? What do you mean, what do I do? <laughs> First of all, if that happens, he's not my friend, right? right? If he if he does that to me, I'm fresh home. He don't give me a heads up like, yo, son, this is what happened, da, da, da. He's not my friend. So the friend uh, attribute is, is going off the table. So now what I do is, listen, I loaned the car to this person at this time, and I don't know what happened. Right? That's the truth. I'm not risking my I'm not returning back to prison for him, right? For nobody. I tell my kids, call the police before you call me. Please. Anything happens to you, call the police before you call me because I can't see myself volunteering for another state bid. I can't. So unless it's actually physically harm being done to my body or my 
community that I'm around at that moment, I, I'm I'm praying that I have the restraint to call the police and and don't react in a way where it will cause me my freedom. Right. And so yeah, you know, I, I so, talk I talk a lot about um how you gotta when you got a prison, you gotta value yourself first. Outside right. anything else, I don't get I'm I'm talking about you gotta value yourself because if you don't value yourself, you won't value your freedom and you're not gonna value anything else. So just it's just like you said, you know, don't call the police before you call me. I'm not trying to volunteer to go back to prison. I'm trying to do everything right. I can to be free. Why is it important to have that mentality? Once you get out of prison, when you really try not to go back, um, I think for one, for me, I'm not even going to generalize it. For me, I know the person I was, right? So I was always an angry person from teenage years. From my, from as long as I can remember, I was, I had like an anger issue, right? I didn't want nobody to hurt me or do anything to me, so I lashed out first. So. Knowing that, being being aware of that, I know that okay. When situation arise, what are my options? So having that mindset of okay, there are options, right? You have to realize that there are options. Then you could say, okay, one option A, B, or C. Which one? is best for me so these are the this is the mentality i think people should have as ex-cons as formerly incarcerated individuals know that you have an option now your option the option that's best for you everybody's not gonna like it everybody's not gonna agree with it so then this is where you have to stand in your square and say it doesn't matter if it offends if somebody dislikes it or somebody loves it this is what's best for me and that's why it's important to have that mind state because you have to know that there's options once you know there's options your world opens up because without you close mind right you right you have the horse blinders on only thing you see the tunnel vision is what's in front of you and that will cause you to crash all the time Exactly. Yeah, I most definitely agree with that. So you out, you know, you what was your first job like when you got out? Um, my first job actually I was I was blessed. I always I always I have to say I was blessed. And um I thank God. I, I'm 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 heavy on the spiritual side, not too much on the religion. If you know people understand there's a difference. So um I'm sorry, this is killing me right here. <laughs> I got a complex, like I hate, and then I'm I'm sideways, and the thing there go a little better. <laughs> but um, that's the Harlem. Uh, that's that Harlem. It uh, is. It is. It is. It is. You have to. You have to look the part. You have to. <laughs> right. But um, for me, I was blessed. Um, in so many ways that I didn't realize it. Just the the way things transpired, my transition, I came home, I had about, well, I'm gonna tell you about my first job. I came home, I had about $1,200, $1,100 from the state that I, I know I worked for, I earned. When I came home, I was so happy to see my kids. You know, I'm taking cabs places, I'm taking them out, I'm doing things with them. That 1100 went like this, a little 1150, whatever it was, immediately gone in a month. Right. And that's a long time, though, for somebody to have eleven hundred dollars. So no public assistance, nothing. So at the time, the, the, the young lady I was dealing with, she said, um, you have to go to welfare. You have to go to public assistance. So I'm like, nah, I don't do public assistance. This from my background and the way I was raised, my moms and everything like I really dislike public assistance. You know, I applaud it for the people who need it, you know. It's something is good, but if, if for me, if I don't actually need it, I'm gonna figure out everything in my power not to take it, right? Leave it for somebody that actually need it. But in the interim of me, you know, 
going back and forth with the young lady, telling me to go, go. I'm looking for classes. I'm, I'm going to school, but it's really not no income. So one of my family friends, they own the fish and chips, the uh, um, soul food restaurant. And uh, I was telling him, like, damn, I can't find a job. You know, I'm just venting to him. He's right. like, yo, you know, my pops are high. You, you know, you like family. You know, pull up, you know, we hire you. So I'm like, yo, I go to school from this time, this time. He's like, yo, don't worry about it. As long as you get four or five hours in, you, you got a job. You go, you know, we're going you know, to help you. So my first job was out of prison was actually that, was the fish and chips. I was a cook. Okay. You know, steamed fish, fried fish, and all that stuff. So I did that for about almost a year. I think it, I think for a year I did that. They held me down for a year. And what happened, yeah, I did that for almost a year. And at the same time, I was doing, uh, I was getting my KSAC T, which is um, counseling for uh, substance abuse and, and mental disorders and all. So I was working on that. And uh, I passed, I passed the course, I got that. So once I got the KSAC T, I got an internship at the program and the program, the internship was uh, 90 days or something like that. So within the 90 day period, they see they're going to keep you or they're going to, you know, resource you out to a different company. They, they help you. They definitely assist you in getting employment. So I did so good in my intern internship that they actually kept me, but not as a counselor, as um, a street worker if you will, somebody that go and talk to the clients, to, to that uh, demographic of people, um, people with substance abuse, mental illness, things like that. So I went and actually spoke to them, told them about the program and try to get them to sign up for the program. Okay. And then, you know, so between the fish and chip store and uh, the outreach worker, that's what they're called. That was the title. That's what I did for my first job. Uh, and I actually had them jobs. I had the fish store job, like I said, for like a year. And then once I passed the internship and got into the actual company, I had the company job for almost five years. I stayed there until I left until I changed, um, changed careers. Okay. So that's why I said I was blessed on that note. Like I had, I was employed from probably like the ninth, tenth month I was home up until now. That was, I think, seven, eight years I've been home. All right. So, so, so tell us, tell us about your book. You know, what was the book about and how did you transition into writing the book? Okay. So the book um, actually came about because um, it started as, idea I had for me and two of my other comrades that was locked up with me. It, it came to me actually like a dream. Like I always I tell people and sometimes it's, it's a little weird, but a lot of my best ideas when even if it's monetary or just life wise, it comes in dreams and like in the shower, like things just appear like poof, like oh like I could see it vividly. And um the book came, it was like, oh man, we should do this. Meaning take our old letters and our writings and our own, because everybody in prison that I know usually has a journal. So it's just like a release. So I had one, the two guys I know, they had some. So I said, yo, let's compile our, our stories and everything and make a book give it to the people so they have an understanding of what we went through, not just what people see on TV, because usually you see on TV, you don't get the emotional part with it. All right. you get is, you know what I'm saying? The script, like what they bring yeah. across, whatever. Okay. So I said, yo, we should do this and really shine a light on the rawness of prison, not what these guys out here glorifying. So most people, well, not most people, these two guys, right? They was like, nah, I'm not with that. I don't want people to know me 
in that way, right? I'm not for that. That's your thing. You thought about it. You go ahead. You do it. So I'm like, damn. Like I thought about it for <laughs> us, right? Like so yeah. I put it to the side, and then um, it just kept nagging at me, nagging at me, nagging at me. I'm like, damn. Well, you know what? Let me really let me look and see what I have. So I went back in my archives. I looked at my my books, my poems, all my writings, some of the letters. And I was like, damn, this can't be a book. So now I start focusing inward more on me. If I was to do the book, how would I do it? And then that's pretty much how the book came about. I started looking at poems. It really started with one of my poems. And I'm like, damn, if this poem came, because I had, I had recited the poem uh, in prison one time. And everybody was like, yo, we love that. You should send it out and try to get it published, put it in this magazine, this magazine. It's called um, I Am. So I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, if this one poem can make people feel like that in prison, I can imagine if I put more poems together and then put my story with it. So that's what I did. The book, that's how the book came about. It's literally writings, thoughts, and letters. From myself, from a two-time okay. felon. Right. You know, so it was like I, it, it started out as an idea for me and a couple of my comrades to give to the people and give them insight and just rawness of really what's going on with the emotional part attached to it. And then it went from that. And once I uh, I published it, once I you know I wrote it and it was all compiled and put it together and put it out. I had a couple, I had a couple of talks with some, I had some talks with a couple of people and these talks, they just kept uh, lifting, lifting my spirits and opening my mind to what else I can do with the book. Yeah. Speaking up, doing speaks, doing, doing, you no know, speaking engagements, uh, mentoring the youth, which I was already doing. I, you know, I always like to, uh, speak to the youngins, you know, give them a little jewel here and there. And I look, you know, I, I keep a, a fresh cut and, and look. I can fit in with the young guy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? For the most part. Once I start talking, they say, oh, this nigga, oh, that, it's an old, it's an old, it's an OG. Yeah, it's an OG. But I come around, you know, I got my little hoodie on, got my level on, you know, my Tim's. You know, I'm looking like one of them yeah. outside of my pants sagging. So when I be I be vibing with them, they know they they take heat. So I find myself in these circles with younger cats, and I just be dropping jewels. Like I'm never gonna stay sit here and knock somebody hustle. Do what you do, but just have the foresight of what's what's to come, right? And I never tell them, oh, you're gonna go to prison or you're gonna be dead. Like we all heard that, and we still went the same path, right? Same path, so you gotta right. tell them something new, right? So. Talking to people, they say, yo, you can do this, you can do that with the book. I say, you know what, you write. That's what I'm going to start doing. So it went from just writing the book just to be an author, right, and to give people something, a piece of myself, to actually using the book as a tool. So now I like to say that it's a, it's the middleman between the streets and prison. It's, it can be inserted into a kid's life, into some youth life, and give them a, a shock, a reality. And maybe, maybe that little shock, them little hundred pages, something in there be like, damn, I ain't know it was like that. So even we just get the kids to that one second of doubt. When they man or somebody say, yo, come on, we got the hammer, or yo, come sell this, or that one second of doubt can turn their whole life around. Like, you know what? Not right now, right? Like, nah, give me a minute. True, For them dude. to say, give me a minute, or yo, yo, I, I gotta go do this real quick. And they even they lying, you know, just you know how kids are, they don't they peer pressure, they don't want to say, I'm not doing that. They come up with something. And that's what them hundred pages are hopefully something in there they read they hear about 
from somebody else or whatever the case, however they get to it, that it'll give them that moment of clarity, that one moment of, mm, nah. And hopefully that right there saved their life. So now that's what I use the book for. That's why I start reaching out to people like you, um, Will Evans, just neighborhood the ben neighborhood benches, uh, all these organizations because that's what I wanted. That's that's where it's at now. Where before I did the book, like I said, it was just more self gratification. And once I did it, I spoke to a couple in a light spark. Like it's bigger than you. And I'm like, it is, it is. So, you know, that's really where it's at now. So that's why I'm really passionate about the reentry programs and just uh, trying to find a solution. Cause we all know the problem. I come to the table, we all know the problem. Yeah. We can, we can recite the problem a thousand ways. <laughs> exactly. You no, know, so I want I want to be, I want to be held in the steam with the with the people that came with a solution or had a idea that led to a solution. Right. Right. So so let's get into um I'm gonna just say this one word or well, two words and, and you tell me what that means to you. Be unstoppable. Hmm. And I'm gonna throw a word back to you. Impervious. And that is what unstop being unstoppable is. It's never wavering, never, uh, never backing down, never stop believing in what you are. I or I said this um a little while ago. I think you posted it on the, on the fly too. Like fight for your life, fight for the life that you want to live, and that's what being unstoppable is. It's when people, when a thousand people tell you no, go ask the thousand first person. When it's cold, raining, the worst storm of your life is happening at 9.15 at night. Whether that storm and know that about 5.50, 6, 6, 10 in the morning, the sun gonna shine again. Know that. So that's what being unstoppable is. It's never giving up on yourself. Never give up on yourself. I've read so many books and I've talked to so many OGs and um, smart minds. It was a, it's a, uh, it's a story. A gold miner, a coal, uh, actually an oil miner. He brought all this equipment. This is years ago, you know, 18 something. He brought all this equipment. Go out to the desert. He drills for years. Drills for years. Never find oil. He said, you know what? I'm just gonna sell equipment, cut my losses, I'm out. He sold equipment for a fraction of what it's worth. The guy who bought the equipment dug a little deeper, hit oil. That's a real story. I just can't. It's in my books. It's a real story, right? And that is just uh, goes to say that that extra inch, that extra mile that you you feel like you can't go, go, because that's where the finish line is at. That's where the gold is at. My son told me something. We got a podcast, me and my son, right? Cool. Everybody has a podcast. We joke on that because everybody has a podcast. So right. <laughs> we, we make we make light of that, right? Yeah. But the podcast is, is, is pretty good. We, we talk about some good things. And he said, um, you know, in any sport, the hardest part of the sport is getting to is, is scoring, right? So football, you get you run 99 yards. You run past however you get down there, 99 yards. You beat up. 
You got one yard to go. You know that's the hardest. <laughs> yeah. That you is the it. hardest. You, that you one yard. All the downs is to get that one right. yard. <laughs> that one yard is the hardest yard. But you know what? When you cross that fence line, you exactly. You 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 home, baby. You feel that's that's your that that is what all the ninety nine yards of running is for for that one yard. So that's what being stoppable is. Is run them 99 yards. Get across that one yard. Never give up on yourself. Right. And so go ahead and tell the people the name of the book, where they can find it. Definitely. Um, the name of the book is Moments, Writings, Thoughts, and Letters of a Two-Time Felon by David Raleigh Hopper, David Hopper. Um, as moments, writings, thoughts, and letters of a two-time felon. It's on Amazon. It's on uh, the bookpatch.com. And also, if you in the five boroughs, I love to meet the people. So you could DM me, inbox me, cash at me. Uh, it's ten dollars. I don't charge extra. You know, a guy was like, "Oh, you should charge an extra five dollars because you're gonna bring it to him and autograph." I'm like, I'm not really in it for the money. Like, my money is going to come. I'm not really worried about that. Like, I just posted today. I got an email from, from uh, Kindle, you know, from my, from my, from my, uh, from my sales. You know, yeah. it's passive income. You know, $30 here, $40 here, $7, whatever, you know, it all works. But as long as I know that somebody's out there is buying it, somebody out there is being touched by it. That's that's good for me. So yeah, you can inbox me, DM me, any social network, and uh, you in the five boroughs, I'll definitely bring it to you. Meet, we chop it up. Who knows what'll happen from there? Right. So you were talking about how you and your son got the podcast. What was it like transitioning back into your children's life? Like you said, when you got out, they went from 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 uh, smaller. They went from you know from kids to adults to the, up in the upper teens where they had their own life. And so what was what was it like making that adjustment to who they were once you got out? That's a good question. Um, I go through the ages. I go from the youngest to the oldest. So the youngest was my son. My son is the youngest. So when I came home, uh, I actually seen him first because he was in school. I went to him first. But um, the transition of dealing with them, at first, the first couple of months, it was cool. You know, everybody was happy. It's always happy, happy, joy, joy. And then once everybody settled in, back to their own lives, because they live with their moms, you know, um, and the conversation started. But now they're older. So now the discussion is just starting. You know, my son actually told me one day, I owe him. Like, literally, like, nah, Pops, you owe me. Cause I forgot what it was. I think cause I, we had a routine. I take them out to the movies every Saturday. I took my daughters out to eat every other week. Like this is how we 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 was trained. This was the transition to getting back to know each other. So I forgot. He kept asking me for toys and this and that. And I said, "Yo, man, what's up, man? I didn't keep buying you all this stuff, man." He said, "You owe me." Like he was serious. Right. She told me I owe you. He said, man, you know how long you was going? Right. I'm like, all right, I give you that. You know, so I I you know what's what's crazy? I apologize so much. Excuse me. I apologize so much to my kids. They actually told me to stop. That's how much I apologize. Like, literally, like, yo, I'm sorry. Anytime I seen them, I talk to them, we kick it, I'm sorry. You know, I'm really sorry. I messed up. I'm sorry. So much so, they just like, all right, Pops, we get it. Like, you sorry. We know. Stop. Like, okay. We cool. Right. We cool. We good. You know, so my son, like I said, he told me, yo, I owe him. So that was kind of like a wake-up call, you know. Um, but just continue to talk to him. And I actually let them be who they are. When I did, I did make a mistake when I came home. I had 
these grand schemes, these ideas. I had a whole book, but I had like, I've been locked up six years. I got all kind of thoughts and what I want for my kids and what they're going to do, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, look, this is what you're going to do. You can do this, X, Y, Z, invest in this and do this. And right, da, 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 da. I'm texting all kind of inspirational quotes in the morning. <laughs> so my daughter tell me, so I told you we have, we have daddy daughter dinners and outings. So they told me one day about their uncle that was locked up and he came home. He gave them quotes. He said, they said, yeah, probably, you know, you, you kind of remind us of uncle so-and-so. I said, wow. So they said, um, he be giving us these quotes and all that. We blocked his ass. <laughs> a word? <laughs> said, a word? They said, yeah. I said, well, I don't want to get blocked, right? I said, yeah, Pops. They, we don't want to hear that shit. Like, straight up. You know what I'm saying? Now, they, they grown, right? They said, I don't want to hear that. Just, just chill. Like, just, just chill out with us. That's all we want. All right, say less. And that's really that. Them two moments, my son told me I owe him, and the moments that my my daughter told me like you're doing too much. Just chill out. Just let us rock out. We we love you. You know what I'm saying? We you know you love us. You made a mistake. Just let it happen organically. So from that moment, I took their advice. I fell back. I still called them. We went out. We still, but it wasn't me. When I got with them, it wasn't a lecture. It wasn't. Le this is what you're gonna do. Hey, did you, did you did you read that book I told you to read? Hey, did you go here? Did you do that? Did you follow up on that? Like kids don't want to hear that. They grown. They've been here. They've been without you six years, dug this thing out. So that was the transition. That was the hard part. But once I really. And I was, I'm thankful. I really have good kids. Like, I really have good kids. I really have good kids. I I salute my kids all the time. I'm really proud of them. Um, So they actually helped me in my transition. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Right. So we're so we looking at the recidivism rate of people that's get out of, getting out of prison. They're going back, you know, uh, within three years. Is, you're talking yeah. about 68%. You're talking about within five years, you're looking at about 75 to 77 percent. So right. with you getting out and you building this relationship back with your children, you you know, you adapting to their life and not forcing your way in. Did you was it ever a trust thing where you had to build trust with them because they, you know, um, and kind of proved to yourself that I'm not here to stay. I'm not going back. Yeah, definitely. And it was even some other things, some other trust issues outside of just the prison thing. Uh, yeah, I think for that, for, for the, the prison, for the recidivism, for the, the going back in, my kids know me. Like, I never spoke to my kids as babies. Like, at their youngest age, I can't remember. Like, oh, you know, this. I never, I never, never. I never in my kids' life did that. It was always, listen, this is what's going on. Do you understand me? No? All right. Um, okay. You see these little things right here? You see these these dolls? This is you. This is me. Da, 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 da. I explained it to them, but never baby talk. So they always had an understanding of real life. Right. So they know who I am. And when I, they know when I say I'm going to do something, one way or another, I'm going to do it. So I told them, like, it wasn't even about don't worry. I think they, they, I don't think they worry about me doing anything to go back. It's more about parole. But like I told them, they was like, yo, pops, make sure your ass in the house, right? Because <laughs> I was still right. busting moves. I'm still going out of state because when I came home, I still have, I still have to do the things that I need to do for myself. So the media, I had, I, I knew I, I still had to build my brand. Like, this is what I'm going to be doing. So I, I was going to Jersey, doing interviews. Um, I started uh, a whole TV show up again when I came home. So, you know, I was still doing that. So on that aspect, they was like, yo, come on, Pops, like, be careful. Like, 4th of July, I remember my first, I came home in June, 4th of July. 
I went to my brother's house in Albany. I'm not supposed to leave the borough, right. Right? right? I left early in the morning, got there. Once they did the fireworks, I came back. I got home like 10 o'clock. I was supposed to be in the house at 8, but my P.O. said like, you know, mm -hmm. 9 o'clock, I usually come after 9. If I do come, as long as you can tell me where you at, you're on your waist, and I can wait for you, I won't violate you. But you don't answer your phone, and you, you don't answer your phone, you're not home, you're going to prison. So I made sure like I, I was I took I was blessed. So I always had some kind of leeway or you know, one way or the other. But I don't think they was worried about me going back to prison for doing an illegal activity more than violating parole, which in high, which in all actuality is the problem itself when we talk about reentry and recidivism. Is parole how they deal with us as Ex cons of formerly incarcerated people. Right. I got this thing I say, um, and a lot of people, a lot of dudes, because when I be uh doing my reentry and I go out and do reentry work and I be talking to people just getting out of prison and they be playing like, man, my PO give me all these stipulations. And I always tell them, you know, what's the stipulations? You know, a lot of times the stipulations be no drugs, no alcohol. You know what I'm saying? Get you a job. They're going to hit you with a curfew off top. You're going to get that curfew. Right. You know, I had my, my I got out. My, my curfew was 1030. You know, they was like, don't hang around convicted felons that really ain't doing right. nothing. And I always say, if you really want to be successful in your transition and want the best for you and putting yourself first, your them expect you sh your expectation for self should be aligned with them. Just them, them small expectations right there. It should supersede them stipulations. Right. Yeah. And I was going to ask you how you feel about that. Um, About the about stipulations? The, or about, about how you said they uh, su to supersede them uh, stipulations. Like, yeah. Um, I, I believe that coming home, you already know there's going to be some stipulations. They're going to be some boundaries for you, right? You 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 went inside this box. It's mentality. I, that's what I tell do when you talk about the reentry. And you know, I, I'm 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 on my I'm in my circle with the dudes. You know, that's what I that's what I that's what I try to get across to them. It's mindset. It's your mindset. It's your perception. Nothing is going to change until you change your mindset. So you go in and you do a three year bid. You do a two to four, three to six, seven flat, whatever it is, and you go in and you come home thinking that you're going to do the same thing you did before you went in, then you're crazy, right? Because now the thing that you was doing before you went in got you put in. <laughs> right. <laughs> One way or the other, right? Even you was drunk and you got into a fight, you pull your pistol out, right? Somebody says something about your man or something, and you know, y'all gathered in because your man can't fight, then you wind up going to prison. You sold some drugs, right? You sell drugs. Most drug dealers, they say, oh, don't get high your own supply. Most most drug dealers, it's factual, smoke their weed, you know. So you selling drugs, you smoking weed, makes you lazy, your point. So you did something, you got caught up slipping, right? Somebody told on you. Like even okay, you you wasn't you ain't get caught slipping, but somebody told on you. Whatever the case, who you who told on you? The guy that you was hanging out with. So right. to go back, whatever you was doing before you got locked up, got you locked up, and you think you're gonna go home and do the same thing. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, that don't make sense. So, so the thing is, you have to change your mentality. So you come home. And that's what the phase go back to the phase two, three, and four. That's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to um, address the mentality, the, the mental state of the inmate, but it really yeah. doesn't. But you say, okay, I come home. I know I'm going to have a curfew. I, I know I can't drink. I can't smoke. So you know what? Smoking my little weed in top. You know, you know, you damn near could get everything from the street in the prison. Exactly. I seen heroin addicts, 
niggas is smoking weed. Um, man, you see it all. Niggas taking pills because you know <laughs> everything drunk. that's on the <laughs> ass is in prison. Yeah, right. Vagina niggas is buying vagina from the COs. Like everything in on the street is in prison. Exactly. So okay, I'm gonna have a. I'm gonna have a curfew. I accept that. I can't smoke. Right. Accept that. I might can drink, but depending on what what my crime is, I won't be able to drink. So accept that. Right. right? So these are stipulations. Yeah. Now, when you get to your PO, he tell you, "Oh, you can't do it. You can't do it." I'm like, "All right, you comfortable with that? Because you already know that. You already you already built yourself." You already built your armor. Your armor is built. That's not going to be a change in your armor that you can't stay out past nine o'clock. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, that's not a change in your armor. Like, that shit ain't going to do nothing to me. Like, okay. And that was my message. That's how I came home. Like, okay, I ain't going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to do this. I ain't smoke weed before I got locked up. Like, before I went, got locked up, I stopped smoking. Yeah. So that was not a problem for me. I never did hard drugs. The curfew, I already knew, like, all right, my dudes are going to come to the crib. My circle is small. And the circle I have loved me so much that they're going to tell me, bring your ass, go home. Right. Ain't, you on, ain't you on curfew, nigga? What you doing out here? So, so you know, I, I say, to sum it up, when you come home, when you talk about the stipulations, I believe individuals have to change their mind state. Your state of mind, you have to change your mind. You have to change your thinking. And just come to grips, come to accept that these are the things that they're going to lay on you when you get out. Acceptance is a beautiful thing. Once you accept something, it's not going to bother you. Yeah, definitely. That's how you got to do it. You definitely got to be able to, like you said, change your mindset. And accepting like this, I know what I'm going out. This is what I'm facing. This is what I got to do. And it just is what it is. Either I'm going to do it or I'm not. You need to go accept the fact that you're not going to do it. Or are you going to accept the fact that you're going to do it? You right. know, for, I uh, met a guy. I met yeah. a guy real quick that was in there. He said, and this is how I knew prison wasn't for me. I said, yo, this is not my thing. Like I, I made a mistake. I dumbed down. OK, I ain't coming back. He told me, yo, this is an occupational hazard for me. <laughs> I said, yeah, we ain't never gonna be cool. Yeah, we ain't, yeah, yeah. You ain't got no. He said, this is no an occupational hazard. We in prison. We ain't in the county. We not in Rikers. This we in state prison with green zone. He said, this is an occupational hazard. I said, yeah, this is not for me. It's not for oh, me. Man. It's not. I'm just now. Nah, I'm not yeah. gonna do that occupation. <laughs> no, that's not. Yeah, this. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, we too, so, too you know, we, we too different. I mean, I mean, you just have people that just have that mentality, and you know, and they accepted that, right? And that's what I'm saying. So acceptance, either way, either you're gonna accept like this is your life, and this is what I'm gonna do, or this is my life, this is what I'm gonna do. And you know, when it comes to the stipulations and recidivism, you talk about um, support because support is very big we we need some type of support when you come home and uh i i got this i got this thing um i put together when i was locked up it's called the umbrella effect and this is some of the things one of the things that i like to you know i throw on the board and i i give to people when i do my talks and stuff and so um, you bring your umbrella out when it's a storm when it's raining right so right. I'm going to tell it to you quick because you it's an illustration, but I can tell it to you. So you bring your umbrella out when it's a storm and it's raining. You got the main piece, the handle, right? The rod, and then this, this, this brackets. So it's about eight brackets on the umbrella. So you got to have, you come home, the handle part, that's your foundation. Either the house you live in, the parent, whatever's 
the most significant in your life, that is that one piece. The person that's never gonna tell you, it's okay. You can be a, you know, you can be an asshole. Oh no, you can smoke weed. It's the person that's gonna tell you, you're an asshole. Don't do that. That's not right. That's gonna wind you up. That's gonna send you back. That person, I like to call him the anchor. That's the, that's the person. That's the first person. And then you have your homeboy that love you to death. And he's busy. He's always busy. But he's not too busy for you. He's a bracket. Then you may have an aunt, an older aunt or a cousin. You know. So you get these people around you and you build you a fort, your umbrella. So when it rains, because it will rain. You have your umbrella. So when you have your umbrella, it keeps you from getting soaked. You're going to get wet. It's going to rain, but you won't get soaked. It won't overcome you. And that's the whole idea of the umbrella. So oh, yeah, like come home. And you have to, and I tell people, see, that, that my, my, my goal is hopefully I could get this, get inside of prison because I have to do this like before people left, we, we had these groups. So I tell them, start now while you're in prison. You know, you reach out to people, you know, you write letters, but you, for most of us, writing is right, right? You know, I'm going to catch some right, write your letter too. Yeah. But in writing, in, 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 in right, find out who you can use as your support team, truthfully. And I say use because Everybody is used, just don't misuse them. So right. that's my that's my thing. I say when you talk about support and uh what can actually help with the recidivism rate is definitely support. Building that umbrella, like you said, building that umbrella. Right. Yeah, most definitely. So we got a question. One of the questions is uh from one of the uh one of the people that's watching says, Why is it a struggle for men to open up? I can show it up on the screen. It says, why is it a struggle for men to open up? Most men are incarcerated due to the untreated trauma. Hmm, that's the two part. Why is it a struggle for men to open up? Um, For me, truthfully, it was, and this crazy that this is a beautiful question because this is one of the things that me and my son spoke about on our podcast and it's talking about, um, uh depression and it, it 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 starts from as a man as a black man when you three years old you get a spanking and you and the toy Beasley Jr. can probably answer this you three years old you get you get you get beaten you cry what's your father or your mother tell you we better not cry <laughs> he better he better not cry <laughs> fix your face so now for generations, right? I don't know how old you are, but for generations, we was told you better not cry. Now I'm 25 years old in love with this beautiful woman. And she telling me, you can cry. Open up. No, that's not going to happen. So that's re reality. That's I'm not going to say it's the top reason. I don't have the statistics, but I'm sure that's one of the top reasons, right? It's ingrained in us. It's it's um it's systematic, if you will. Yeah. Um I forgot the second part of the question. I, I wanted to get it both parts. Most, it said uh most most men are incarcerated okay. due to un untreated trauma. Yes, and that's the other the other part is about um incarcerated due to the untreated trauma. Like myself, I put myself in there. Um I never got the the um the help to deal with my anger, like from a youth. So I'm growing up 14, 15, 16, 17. I got 20 years of anger and trauma, and my mom's a heroin addict. No, my pops abandoned me. Right, all these thoughts. Now I'm, you better not say nothing to me. I'm going ham on you. Right, you try to disrespect me. That's why 
black folks, especially black men, get so irate when 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 we talk about your mama. What my mama? Right? It's untreated wow. trauma because now somebody hurt me when I was younger, and you better not dare say nothing to me now because I can I can protect myself. So now I'm gonna protect myself, and you say anything that doesn't align with what I think is correct, I'm going at you. And he's absolutely right. Untreated trauma leads to incarceration. That's a beautiful. That's that's definite. I, I just definitely agree with that. Ego, I mean, yeah. ego, it. I think, all, them to, I think all that plays in line too. I think all that all that ties in with each other because when you talk not to cry, you really talk. Not to show no emotion to be hard. So now you carrying this throughout your whole life. You no know, emotion. I'm heartless. I'm I'm hard. Yep. You know, and dealing with other issues that may on top of that. You know, saying mother on drugs, father ain't around. You all that right. just piling, and it's and it's and it's and it's, it's killing you on the inside. And you just don't know how to, you know, even go about even dealing with it or how to handle it. And you just exactly. and, it, and it puts a chip on your shoulder. So now you walking around with a chip on your shoulder with the mentality of show no emotions. I gotta be hard. And you know, it it it, 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 it can it can explode. And when it explodes, yep. it explodes for the you know, for the worse. Exactly. Exactly. Definitely. Yeah. So yeah, man, we appreciate having you on. Let the people know where they can find you at uh social media, websites. Uh, let them know where your book is at again in the name of the book so they can Definitely. reach out and, and show some support and love. Okay. Um, you can find the book on Amazon. You know, everybody know Amazon. David Hopper. Moments, writings, thoughts, and letters of a two-time felon. Amazon and the book patch.com. Um, my social media is Facebook, David Hopper. Instagram, I am David underscore unstoppable. Twitter is dhop522. Those are my three main uh, social media. You know, I'm active on all three of those. And then we actually have our own website, beunstoppable1.com. And the beunstoppable1.com has all our content, has the game show that uh, we created. We have a hip hop game show we created. Um, Debatable, never seen nothing like this. You know, uh, we have uh, other people's work and um, creative creatives on there too as well. So those are my you know, my go tos. Oh, so yeah, once again, man, uh, we appreciate you coming on, sharing your story, sharing your knowledge, giving the game. Uh, anytime you want to come back, you're welcome to come back. Uh, if you're not in the group, you're welcome to join the uh the reentry group and check out other podcasts that we have going on. Be able to reach out to other people and connect because that's what we're building here is a reentry support group, a connection where we all can link up with each other. You know, when COVID allows everything to open back up, you know, we can start really making some things happen, getting in the same room, speaking and, and, and raising people up, you know, doing what we do, you know, sharing our experiences. So again, man, I appreciate that you coming on, sharing your story with this man, and you know, uh, anything I can do for you, or you know, just reach out. I'm, I'm always going to be got an open a open hand out for you. Thank you, I appreciate you. Um, definitely, I love what you're doing. That's why I reached out. It's um something that's very much needed. You know, not just to have these platforms and talk gibberish, but to actually bring some information to the people and some inspirations. You know, I, I like to call myself walking motivation because if, um, if I can do it, anybody can do it. I'm literally from the mud. So, um, and I, you know, I still got a ways to go, but I love where I'm at right now. You know, so I thank you and I salute you for doing what you do. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for oh, being on. Absolutely. Me too. Before we, um, before we go, um, on shameless plug, we actually be doing a, a documentary called uh, Prison to Prosperity. It's the docu-series. And we actually shine, shine the light on individuals, formerly incarcerated individuals who come home and doing the right thing. You know, it's not, they don't have to be millionaires or celebrities or famous, but they're doing good work out there in the community. 
And what we here to do is to show that people can come home from prison and prosper. Right. Man, mm -hmm. that's important. That's an important thing to broadcast because it gives the people that's coming home something they can see. Like, okay, yeah, I know it's right. I know I'll be able to make it happen. So yeah, so anybody, you know, we we travel, we travel. You know, even though in the middle of it, we COVID safe, we do travel to get the interviews. You know, if you know anybody, you want to recommend somebody, um, you know, just holler at me and we'll make it happen. Oh, all right, most definitely. I, I send some people your way, man. I know a few people, man, that you know that that'd be good, good, good look for it. Okay, I appreciate you. I appreciate you, King, man. You have a blessed one. Thank you, you too, brother. Thank you. All right, now. Yeah.